Hey Richard. Ah, Sandeep, how are you? You went to the wrong idea, really. <laughs> I believe so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a learning curve. I was telling my friends who are there already. There is a small learning curve uh, when we start these things, so it happens. For sure, but uh, I think we got it figured out and we're ready to go. And you look quite healthy and fit, so that's pretty good. I mean. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I mean, certainly a surreal time in life, and uh, one that causes a lot of uh, introspection. But uh, trying to maintain a, a formal schedule and uh, stay committed to to working out and and, and taking care of myself. So, uh, you know, we feel you know very lucky at this moment. I think it's really. I mean, you know, uh, of course, this uh, definitely a very negative time in terms of what's happening. But of course, it's a big opportunity for all of us to take care of things we were not able to take care of uh, before. Our health, absolutely. our family, our yeah, thoughts. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I've I've mm -hmm. had invaluable time with my family, and it's it's been a a very strong support network for me over the last several weeks. So that's great. I thought you were in Mexico, but you are in uh, you are in New York, uh, I think. Yeah, I'm actually in New Jersey. I'm about 14 miles due west of uh, Midtown Manhattan in uh, North Jersey. All right. So um, uh, I think the things. Uh, I mean, uh, how the things in New Jersey? Because New York is not so good, I believe. Yeah, I mean, New York has uh, begun to see a flattening of the curve and a daily decrease in new admittance to the, uh, the hospital. Uh, so that's a, a good statistic and a good indicator. And New Jersey is probably about two weeks behind New York. Um, so uh, it's interesting to see uh, how it plays out. But uh, as long as people practice uh, maintaining social distance and hand washing and wearing masks and doing uh, the necessary uh hibernating at home, so to speak. I think that, uh, you know, we've been able to have an impact on the trajectory of the, the spread. And I think that's really important. So what do you make of this crisis? What uh, what this is crisis doing to us <clears throat> in terms of our business, our profession, where it is going to lead, and especially the Mexican industry, we are talking about the Mexican country. Yeah, I, I mean, in, in particular, I think that uh, the industry in, in and of itself was under a lot of pressure and a lot of change prior to COVID-19. And I think COVID-19 has just uh, really uh, give the, given us a pause and, and, and made us really look at what we were doing. And I think it's going to dynamically change the realities of, of, of which we knew. Uh, I think you know, one can safely say what we knew and what was is for sure over. Uh, we've kind of left uh, uh, analog and, and, and now we're into the digital age. And so I think that uh, the speed and the rapid pace of change will only be uh, exacerbated by this moment. So how do you see the Mexican industry, textile industry getting affected by this? Uh, you know, I think we all have to take a long look at at, at, at our supply chains and, and, and how we do things and really come to fundamentally understand that it has to change. It's a model that's been in place for uh, eons, essentially. And I mean, to conceive, to create, to produce, to put in a warehouse, to hopefully sell uh, is a model that's broke and uh, was predicated on... Uh, long supply chains that are difficult to manage and, and, and very hard to have risk mitigation uh, relative to uh, the length of it. But uh, we need to compress the supply chain. We need to move to a demand-based production that uh, is more amenable to the realities of, of, of what's being demanded and what's wanted. So it's going to take technology. So what do you actually uh, mean by demand-based, on-demand production? So how does it, you know, in current context, how does it affect us? In the current context, it's going to be a struggle only because you have to have a position of all your input variables prior to production, and you've got to have a, a projection based on what you think your consumption or demand is going to be. And, and I think clearly in this moment, that's, you know, that's the most difficult thing to do. I mean, I think there's, there's three steps to this uh, 
situation we're in and the process we'll go through. So I would call it triage, which was kind of a crisis management. What do we do in the here and now to best uh, maintain the semblance of uh, a stable business? And then a, a transitional period where I think you have time to reflect and have more uh, concrete thoughts and initiatives to make actionable and then a transformative period where, you know, who and what we are on the other side of this will certainly not be what we were. So I think that, you know, uh, those are, are, are basically the three phases, but, uh, you know, clearly I think at Caltech we've gone through the crisis stage of it and we're beginning to be in a transitional uh, perspective in terms of our thoughts and focus. So does it uh, affect the entire, how, how does it affect the entire cycle of uh, uh, fashion in terms of denim fashion where you, you know, from the time you start your product development and uh, you present to uh, customers and the orders are placed and the goods are shipped, so how the entire yeah. cycle is going to be changed? Yeah, I mean, that, we have to address that. And again, it's going to have to come through technology. Um, I think in the near term, uh, having a shorter supply chain, uh, a nearshoring platform where you can respond quicker, change uh, and affect wash uh, if you're narrow and deep on a substrate per se. Uh, it's the most logical way to proceed in terms of speeding up the cycle and delivering uh, smaller capsule in-season collections relative to driving uh, the trends that are that are currently in demand, not ones that we're projecting a year out, because that's just not really in tune with how the millennials look and shop and behave. So I think, you know, that's your most easiest and, and, and uh, obvious uh, address to uh, mitigate the long, the long supply chains we presently are in. So actually, we are looking at uh, some kind of fast fashion, uh, so many negatives about fast fashion. But uh, when we are talking about cycles, if you're short, talking about shorter cycles, that means uh, more fast fashion, actually. Uh, I, not really. I mean, I think fast fashion, if you look at where they're sourcing from, it's more predicated. Uh, it, I mean, it's absolutely predicated on speed. I'm not saying that it isn't, but it's really more predicated on price. And it's really more a disposable uh, apparel item. And uh, I think this is what we need to get away from. And I think that with COVID, value is going to be front and center. I think that, uh, you know, price is important, but it can't be the driver that we, you know, the, uh, the, the drumbeat that we march to consistently. We've got to come up with other ways to address what uh, I believe will be a decrease in conspicuous consumption and more benevolent behavior towards how we manage our resources. So, you know, if you're near shore and you have a quality item and you can turn it, then I think the value proposition is interesting. So in uh, near shoring, uh, for near shoring, definitely Mexico is a very good option for U.S. market. Yeah, I mean, look, Mexico has a long history with America. It's uh, the third largest trading partner with the U.S. It has a daily value of exchange relatively uh, to $1.25 billion. Um, you know, the apparel and textile sector, which is uh, included in the GDP of the industrial sector, which is 32% overall, but the apparel and textile portion of that is roughly 5%. Um, and, uh, it's, you know, Mexico is the number one exporter from Latin America to the U S it's the 15th largest, uh, economy based on GDP. Um, and it's the number one source for men's five pocket jeans in the U S. So clearly there uh, is a means to an end here. And I think that regional relevance in regards to Mexico will play an important role, uh, in the future. Um, can we also, I mean, see this uh, in the behavior of the buyers, uh, big retailers, where, you know, the cancellations, uh, what have happened in Mexico probably are not so much that uh, what, have, uh, what have happened in other countries? Yeah, I mean, I think we've had our partners push goods out um, and we've had some adjustments, to, not necessarily to the magnitude or the, the size that other sourcing regions globally have. Um, so in that regards, we're very lucky, but we also were able uh, 
to become essential an essential business, and we're enjoying uh, robust activity uh, for uh, PPE gown, uh, both make and fabrics, as well as masks. So, because we're the largest vertically integrated entity in the hemisphere, and easily one of the top ten in overall volume, uh, if you consider all of our SBUs, um, you know. It's really allowed us to participate and support uh, the demand for for these products. So, I mean, you're already supplying PPE gowns and other uh, materials to the vaccine government. Uh, we're actually, uh, you know, considering that 80% of exports from Mexico go to the U.S., it's really mainly back to the U.S. Uh, I'm not really involved in the national market per se. I know they do have activity there. I just can't speak to it from a, you know, percentage or, or number or a numerical base value because it's just not my focus. But but they are participating as well. Um, so we are running. We're not full staffed. We're following CDC guidelines in terms of less people within the building, uh, thermal imaging screening, hand washing, mask, uh, and such. So we're taking those precautions because our, our employees are a vital part of our, uh, you know, operation. And we've got to take care of them. So, you know, in that regard, we've, we've been very, uh, very fortunate. So are you using this experience of uh, producing these products, all these health products, production equipments, PPE equipments, uh, to uh develop your denims also to a certain extent to be you know able yeah. to yeah i think i think i think, I think that there is potentially a, a a pathway for indigo based products i don't think it's as big as the peace dye side but certainly with those own finishing some of the lighter weights uh, could be used in uh you know, just a protective barrier, not necessarily a functionality, although I'm sure there are topicals and there's certainly a technology that we're looking into that's an embedded technology uh, that we're trialing and we're very excited about and should be commercialized shortly. But, uh, yeah, I think there's there's some application there. What are the changes in uh, the denim as a product you see in the coming times? Wow. Um, I think that, you know, we tend to always look at denim in and of itself. And I think that at this moment, back to relatable technologies and yarn form, that there's a really uh, good opportunity to use technology to move forward um, and either finalize uh, first and second step type technologies that don't close the loop and others that radically change how we perceive the manufacturing of denim currently. And there's two in particular um, that uh, are of interest and, and, and note, um, you know, you, you have a, uh, uh, an entity in uh, England that was written about in, uh, I believe it was January called Worn Again. And it's essentially uh, a technology that's being scaled up in the lab now to, try and help the separation of commingled fibers, mainly cotton and polyester, which combination thereof with other uh, input variables are roughly 80% of uh, all clothing. So if we can really uh, develop that technology and adopt it in a commercial way, it would speak well to Caltex where we uh, have our echo concept of uh, post-industrial waste recovery. Uh, and we've, uh, put in a capsule collection to that end. But if we had that technology and it was readily available, we could then really complete the circle and do mass collection at the point of purchase with brands. And that would close that loop. And another technology I really like is natural core. And uh, this is a yarn based technology that allows for ring dyed color, but done in the garment uh, dyeing process. And so here you have the ability to stay neutral until you actually have a demand and or an order. And so off of this technology, you can fracture into mass customization and truly on demand. So I think, you know, 
technologies of this nature that are disruptive and allow you to redefine yourself are things that we really need to look at. Um, and I think they're a quicker path to circularity and solving some of the environmental issues as opposed to uh, artificial intelligence or virtual reality, which would take billions of dollars of investment to have the machinery and the ability to really reconstitute and compress the, the current supply chain that we were in. But those are two technologies that I like in particular that I think are of interest to know. They are very interesting. And do you also see that in, uh, as you talk about, talked about neosuring, uh, do you also see that uh, certain markets uh, like US and Europe, they may want to have uh, semi-finished goods coming to their countries and, you know, the finishing is done in their countries uh, so that, you know, that becomes a part of the own demand. Yeah, I mean, it's like the old T-shirt model in the U.S. where you bring in low-value blanks and then print them or be dazzled, be jeweled in, which have you, and, and, and really enhance the value. Yeah, I think there's some, there's some validity in that. Um, you know, it just becomes making safe bets relative to what you think the future is going to be. And, again, I think with the digital age and where we find ourselves um, – it's a near term solution, but long term, I think there's just better technology and we really need to open our minds to it and kind of realize we have a blank page that we can now create whichever we want and or see. It's not necessarily what we knew. Um, so I think uh, that's a possibility. Yeah, it's a possibility for sure. For sure. Uh, coming to retailers and buyers, the big retailers and buyers, um, they have been a big shock uh, last few months, let's say last one and a half months and all. So uh, now are they coming out of the shock and uh, kind of settling down in some way and uh, looking at the future and trying to work out the ways and uh, starting the supply chain in some way, small way? Yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, uh, the three phases or the three T's that I explained before, uh, triage, transition, and transformative, are probably what everybody's going through. And I think that, you know, the brands in particular have uh, some really big issues to tackle. I mean, mainly they've got a season in the store that's, you know, not going to be seen and maybe not be utilized in the near term, but certainly it'll have to be repurposed and repackaged for a later date. But then there's a season that's on order or some of it in some cases is on the water. And, you know, the big question mark is once we have a soft opening of the economy, what will demand look like? And I don't think anybody has the ability to predict that. I think for sure there'll be a, an initial spike just for feel-good purchases, but um, I think people are more concerned with shelter, food, and sustaining uh, their families. So I think that's a really tough question. Uh, for sure, I know McKinsey has a report out and they cited that 38% of the brands globally were not earning the cost of capital prior to this. So, you know, that number has got to be 70, 80% now. So there's some really towering challenges, but I also think that uh, human nature is, you know, when you're pushed into a corner, you know, you, you either rise to the challenge or, or not. So it's almost a, a Darwinian uh, cleansing uh, that's been forced upon us. And, you know, what it looks like when we walk out the door again, I don't know. Um, I've uh, read in recent weeks that certain people have stepped up and have honored the integrity of their orders and their words to certain degrees. And so, I mean, that's encouraging. And, uh, you know, we have to see what these economies that are truly reopening ahead of us, what happens there, because it's kind of a blueprint relative to what we might see several weeks later. But it's it's a it's a the challenge of a, of a lifetime and a career for many of us. Europe is opening in uh, small, uh, small ways. So probably we will have more idea from there. You know, in coming two, three weeks, we'll have an idea of how things yeah. are coming out there. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And, you know, uh, our network is global. So, you know, unfortunately, um, I think what we're doing here is, is, is the mode, uh, modus operandi for some time, for sure. Uh, I'll look forward to seeing everybody again uh, 
hopefully in the near near future. But for now, I think that you know the video conferencing this is a reality, and we need to find a way to work with it and use it to our advantage. In terms of con uh, consumers. uh are you seeing any real of course everybody is talking about the demand going down 50% 40% or whatever figures uh but i mean that is one part is the demand the other part is really the preferences uh the change in the way the people would like to shop uh the with the things they would like to buy do you see any particular uh, big changes in this kind of uh, in the near future yeah i mean i think that you know at least i can speak from a us perspective a lot of our growth was driven on expansion of of uh, square footage and new store openings and such and so from that perspective this was a a really people oriented crowded you know market space so to speak and i think that that will land and for sure online will uh grow um you know and i think the number of stores or outlets that are required to service the business will commiserately uh find its natural level uh, we certainly don't need the uh extensive uh number of doors that uh, we once had but how many i don't know but for sure whatever your brick and mortar becomes it better be a experiential destination where there's a lot of ina- interactivity with the customer base but also it needs to be socially designed to keep spacing in mind until we have a vaccine and an answer to this uh you know uh unforeseen uh danger that that's amongst us now yeah and uh, special safety features uh, and standards for all the shops and all so that they can uh, at least the customers feel safe to come to the shops absolutely absolutely i mean uh you know uh necessity is the mother of all invention and this is one very necessity driven experience in terms of what we choose to do and you know who will we be and it's really it's a choice so um you know you need to stay positive and there there there, there are certainly ways through but we need to forget the old way of thinking coming to mexico again uh, what do you see in next one year uh, the future for mexico especially for the textile industry and the industry out there i think it's cha- i think it's going to be challenging i think if you're singular in what you produce and you're primarily in denim um that's going to be tough because i think that the broader general market uh will crater and then build back up off of it and until we hit that crater and really understand what our bottom is it's going to be hard to figure out where to cast your eyes relative to what returns so i think anybody that's diversified in the textile segment has an opportunity to redefine themselves and like i mentioned our participation in ppe and mass uh who would have known we we certainly weren't talking about it we weren't thinking about it it was a market that was an ancillary market in our piece dye uh business unit but it wasn't our driver per se and you know today it's our driver so it's made us sit up and take notice of maybe opportunities that were around us that we had not looked at traditionally so uh i think you need to be diversified just like a customer base you know you never want to let one client uh own a, a majority of your production because then essentially you're working in owned by them and you, it's better to have a diversified stream and as far afield and as many different market spaces as possible and so we're fortunate at Caltex that we have that ability you know we go from home to piece dyes to denim uh we go from spinning to weaving to dyeing to finish garments so really um you know we have a portfolio to to offer you know where do you like to play how would you like to play and so on and so forth so i think that that versatility that option is is massive the home textile segment must be uh, I, as i was reading some uh, reports and also talking to some people home textile seems to be uh, kind of booming because people at home and they are yeah, looking for I mean, Ironically it's a bright spot but I think people are home I can tell you you know we've painted a room uh, I've ripped up my patio I mean and, you know I've gotten I'm getting around to a lot of things that were on a list that had been uh denied uh attention for a while but yes I think it's 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 not only does it uh 
allow you to feel some control over your environment, which I think we're all experiencing a lack thereof uh, in a broader sense. So um, I think people are, are focused on it and uh, it allows them to escape a little bit. But yes, it's, it, it has seen an uptick. So probably Denim might, uh, you know, might do well to try to get into some uh, home textile segment in some way in a stronger way. Absolutely. I mean, with uh, Zephyr, it's another concept we have here at Caltex, which is ozone finishing. I think that uh, that finishing in particular could be interesting for different uh, segments and spaces and top of the bed for sure would be one because of the crocking issue that it takes up and how clean the denim is, how pure the shade is. Uh, it does a nice job. So uh, I would agree. I think that's probably something that could be of interest. Any other interesting products you're working on technologies uh, specifically related to denim? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I, I wish I could mention the name. It's just, you know, we're in late stages of, of trial development for something that will be uh, marketed broadly in many different segments. Uh, it's embedded technology. It has inherent functionality, and we're really excited about it. And what I would say is, you know, follow us on Newsroom by Caltex and look for the update because it should be coming shortly. But, uh you know, it will have a uh, relative uh, traction uh, for the, the the moment we're in. What positives uh, do you see from the situation? I mean, uh, apart from all the negatives, what positives do you see they are coming out? Well, I, you know, I mean, I think that after every rain shower, there's, you know, sun. And today the sun will set, but it will surely rise tomorrow. And that this pause is one that we usually don't ever have an opportunity. So it's really a chance of a lifetime to, to, to sit with yourself, ask yourself who and what you are and what your intentionalities are. And, you know, have I had the right priorities? And then once you uh, reassess and take that long look, um, you know, again, if we're in the corner, I think as, as people, it's human nature to come out, fighting and i think this is a fight or flight experience and so i choose to stand and fight and i believe that there's a, a brighter future ahead i believe this is a great opportunity uh you know there's a great opportunity for starting new brands and breathing breathing life into older brands and 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 certainly uh opportunity for younger workers to step up and and, and take leadership roles and you know, for old dogs like myself to, to maintain an open mind and continue to evolve ourselves and, and, and learn. Uh, and I would say that, uh, you know, innovation and technology will lead the way as it has in other business sectors. And, you know, I think for Caltech, we want to be accountable and we want our legacy to be one of benevolence. And I think that the things that we've done thus far and the things that the Kalish family have invested in uh, speak to this. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to each and every day. I think I'm working harder now than when I was actually going to the office. So uh, it's been an interesting experience. But, uh, you know, I'm jazzed. I'm going to be positive. You know, I'm, I'm going to come out on top. That's a very positive uh, statement, and I think uh, many of the many of the people I've been speaking to, they have been saying that we have been, you know, we are not busier than before. So, which is a good statement. People are uh, adjusting to the new reality, to, uh, to the new normal, and they are coming out as fighters, you know, as you are doing. Hey, it's look. I, maybe it's a North Jersey guy. It's just my nature, but you know. Uh, we always had a saying in the locker room in high school uh, when I played the cross, and it's cream always rises to the top. So it's time to get churning, and it's time to get that cream to rise, and everybody can be a part of it. So uh, I'm positive. That's wonderful. So anything else you would like to say to the friends who are here, to the denim community? Uh, what they should do this time. Uh, a big heartfelt, I miss all of you, and I can't wait to see you, and I can't wait to actually be able to shake somebody's hand again if that's socially acceptable after this. <laughs> it might be the elbow, I don't know, but uh, for me as a people person, this is great, but I would much prefer to see you in person.
<laughs> so they're really missing that you know they're really miss- missing the person touch and uh, maybe it's going to be a year or something that uh, we are able to be able to do this again yeah i'm sure we will i'm sure we will and i look we forward will. to seeing all my brothers and sisters sisters in the denim world and uh, much love for me to all of you miss you guys greatly thank you richard it was a wonderful Henry, talk thank you thank you for your inputs and uh, i think everybody enjoyed it a lot so wish you all the best and take care and be please stay uh, please stay safe awesome i will and you as well sandeep thank you so much thank you richard thank you bye bye